Hi there. Welcome to the uh, Music Creation Webinar Series, uh, this latest edition featuring, uh, featuring Dave Cobb. Uh, I'm Kerry Thomas from Dolby Laboratories and uh, here to take you through uh, what you need to know about creating music in Dolby Atmos and uh, some workflow benefits. Uh, we'll get to uh, uh, hear from, uh, from Dave a little later on, um, but uh, wanted to, uh, to, to, to take you through some useful workflow um, uh, functionality that you may not have made use of um, uh, previously, but uh, is, is going to be very much uh, useful to you as you dive deeper and deeper into Dolby Atmos music creation. Um, so the agenda for, for today is uh, fairly simple, uh, working with the renderer. Uh, if you're looking for the previous editions of this webinar series, um, which you know I think are pretty useful, um, the QR code uh, presented on screen there will take you to our professional.dolby.com slash music uh, site and uh, from there you'll be able to find the previous webinars. We'll have a Q&A section at the end of the, um, uh, the, the session here as well so you can ask questions about what we cover in the first part, anything that Dave mentions. Um, uh, or anything else that you're you're having having trouble with, um, or uh, have have queries about. So uh, look forward to to taking you through some of that uh, later on. Um, so working with the renderer, the the, the renderer, as you'll have uh, no doubt figured out from previous webinars, is kind of the centre of uh, the studio uh, setup when it comes to working with Dolby Atmos. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Dolby Atmos renderer. Um, whether that's production suite, mastering suite, um, it, it really doesn't have that much uh, bearing, um, but uh, all of this is going to be uh, common across those, uh, across those platforms. So really this is designed to, to help you work more efficiently with, with Dolby Atmos, um, and uh, while we're focusing on Pro Tools here, um, a lot of it is, uh, is common to other workstations as well. So without further ado, let's uh, let's jump in and figure out first off what is an input configuration. Well, the input configuration uh, in in Pro Tools, um, oh, in sorry, in the Dolby Atmos renderer, gradient slip, um, is um, it, it is going to define basically what is going on with these 128 channels that are available for input into uh, in, into the renderer. So um, in the renderer, um, you can find the input configuration here under the window menu and input configuration. So the default uh, capability, which if we hit use default here, is for a 7.1.2. So left, right, center, sub, left side, right side, left rear, right rear, left top, and right top. That's the channel-based component. That's the, the bed, that's what we can assign everything in our session to and get audio passing quite quickly. Um, it's also the, the, the most limiting factor of the, uh, of the Dolby Atmos ecosystem. Uh, 712 is there for scalability, it's there for you know, um, making sure that what is created on one system is going to translate on others, um, both into larger venues and on, also into smaller venues. Um, so. 712 is where you know I'm, I'm definitely happiest making sure that we're uh, all common with. Beyond that, we have audio objects. Now, you can start using at, at channel 11, you can decide, actually, I want to have a 5.0 um, bed. So maybe you've got some element that you also want to hit your channels with, or we can go back and set them all to, to objects. Find music mixers use a lot of objects um, versus the, the channel-based components. Um, and certainly when you're working with something that you want to have maybe a 714, the objects are the ability are, are going to define where you want those four overhead objects to be. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, going going on. So 916 uh, configurations and various things like that. Um, so the objects are really pretty powerful, but more than just defining you know, what, whether it's an object or a bed, um, there's an awful, awful lot of power um, behind them. So Dolby Atmos started in the movie theaters um, and 
you know, the, the post-production workflows that have existed are now, you know, also uh, able to be utilized for, for the music community. So what we're going to show here today is, you know, maybe what happens when we don't want to just have, um, you know, our ADM be 128 channels, but maybe we want to give it a little more color. So the objects here, we're going to um, set up to actually group together how our binaural um, controls are going to be. So we're going to se select these first uh, 10 channels to be off mode. Um, in the next uh, set of channels, we're going to define it to be near mode. Um, next set of channels we'll define as being mid, so we can select across them. Oops, select across them, uh, and then type into the first box mid, and that's going to name the description for all of them to be mid, and then finally bar. So that's a that's a useful you know functionality for for labeling how our input configuration is going to to find the rest of our workflow. So what does that mean? Well, in our binaural render mode window now, we have the ability to, instead of using our default, uh, we can set up our mullet. So near for the front, mid for the sides, far for the overheads and the rears. Um, we can then find our object paths, set those to off, set those to near, um, and then mid and finally far. Um, and this is going to allow us to very quickly in Pro Tools uh, or in any workstation uh, find um, what where the the, the, uh, the the binaural render modes that are going to be particularly useful to us are. And we'll get go a little bit deeper into this in a moment. So how does that show up in Pro Tools? Well, in Pro Tools, um, let me open up my. Um, I'm going to create a new session. So it's going to be my afternoon webinar. And don't ask me where to save. Great, right there. So in our renderer now, we've gone into peripherals and we've connected to our Dolby Atmos um, renderer. So peripherals, Dolby Atmos, we've enabled that and we've connected to our renderer. Um, in our I.O. configuration, um, I have nothing defined. So this is our I.O. configuration by, by you know, deleting everything in, uh, in, in, in the system. So for, for music creation, the bus page has often been a bit of a pain, a bit of a pain to, to deal with. Um, it may be you know, over-engineered uh, for, for some uh, purposes. Um, but this is where it's going to thrive for us. So we've got um, down on, the, on the, uh, the default page here, we've got the ability to use all buses, output buses. As of 2021.6, we can now create either mono uh, outputs um, or stereo outputs. So having a stereo um, uh, object panner um, and allow that to be uh, created by using this default button. So it's going to go out and um, ask the renderer what the input configuration is. So if I hit default here, it's going to go ahead and say, OK, I've grabbed my input configuration. So I've got my inputs labeled with, uh, with the, the rent binaural render modes. I've got now the tracks labeled also for outputs to those, uh, to those groups. Um, and then when we're creating a, tr a track in Pro Tools, so if we create a, a single single track, I've got my bed, which is going to be our ability to pan. But if I want to set this to be a near object, I can very quickly grab an available near object and create that um, create that panner. While that's useful in in some circumstances and certainly allows us to to create a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, useful data. One of the benefits that it, it also provides is if we were to create a bunch more tracks here. So if I was going to head and create 64 audio tracks, um, and I can 
bust these out to the various objects. So select across, bust these to off nodes, near, mid, far, um, and they're all going to also go to the bed. Um, and then I'm able to, on a, sorry, I'm able to say, actually, I'm going to generate some audio across this now. And um, so shift apple three with the option key gives us tone across all of the channels. Um, this is my beautiful Atmos mix. Um, I'm going to decide that actually audio two is instead of going to the object path, it's going to go to the bed. I can now create and, and bounce out this mix um, using the functionality in Pro Tools. So I can bounce out this mix to um, an ADM B wave. So select Dolby Atmos ADM B wave. And with my one bed and multiple objects, um, I can render this out. So I'm going to render this out. Um, currently, I've done that in, off, in non offline mode. Let's, uh, let's fix that. So I'm going to go bounce mix, uh, select to offline mode, afternoon webinar ADM, bounce that out. Um, and what this allows me then to do is send something much more useful to my mastering engineer. So let's go ahead and disable all of these and hide them in the track list. So when I import that, um, uh, where's my file uh, Oh, where's the session? So afternoon webinar. Okay, there we go. So when I import my um, uh, my, my uh, afternoon webinar here, I've got my ADM clip. If I import that, you'll notice in the import session data that these are now labeled. So I've got the bed, I've got my off modes, I've got my near modes, and I can import all of these and get to a, a session which now has labeled tracks. So rather than audio uh, one through 65, I've now got labeled tracks for all of my uh, render modes. So an engineer that receives this downstream, whether that's a collaborator, a mastering engineer, knows the intention that you had with creating uh, those, those binaural render modes. Let's take it one step further. And if we wanted to, in the renderer, decide that actually these two channels were going to be uh, drums, um, I can also label those. I can say that actually my uh, my reverbs that are going to live down here. This is going to be a 5.0 reverb. Um, can be uh, set up in that description. And again, back in our Pro Tools realm, if I come in and select on the bus page, we'll see that those are now labeled inputs off drums, uh, 5.0 reverbs. So this way we can start to develop our our template, our interactivity between you know, sessions. Uh, we can start making you know quicker decisions and really streamline your workflow. It's also going to help downstream where you're sending this again to uh, uh, to a mastering engineer or to another collaborator for them to understand what is on those object tracks. And it's also great for archiving. So if you're sending this to a label, they're putting it into deep storage. Um, at some point in the future, nobody has to figure out what object 65 was um, just by listening to it and, and making the assumption. You can label all of those tracks and it's, it effectively becomes a track sheet uh, from, uh, you know, for, from listening on a tape or something like that as well. So these um, uh, mechanisms are there to, to help you along. So we talked a little bit about the, the grouping of this. Um, and again, this is in the input configuration in the renderer. So in our default state, the, the renderer has um, dialogue, music, effects, narration. And these are utilized in post-production for doing things like m &E passes, right? So you can drop the dialogue, you can put the narration into an m and &E stem uh, or you know, into the, the optional stems. Um, and there's a, a whole bunch of functionality that's really useful there. 
It's not particularly useful for what we're going to do in music. Um, but what we can do is actually decide on some stem groups. So we could say, actually, I want guitars and drums and verbs and plates uh, to be kept separately. Um, and um, label all of these in the in the groups. So here's my stereo drums. Uh, I can assign those into the groups. Um, I can come down here then, and here's my 5.0 reverb. Um, I'm going to assign this to the verbs group. Um, and then, you know, these are going to be part of the, the synths. So I've got far objects for some ethereal synths, um, and that is going to then also feed into my, my Pro Tools I.O. So as I come back into Pro Tools here, um, input configurations, um, you'll see that I've now got my off drums, uh, my object uh, assignment, my groups assignment, um, and this is starting to resemble a, a very well-structured uh, session. But why would you do some of these things? Well, Dolby Atmos is getting into this, this you know, world where actually we're you know, needing to deliver Atmos mixes alongside of stereo mixes, alongside of parts, you know, all of the, the various things. Now, the functionality in the renderer that we have for doing some of that stem work um, is in the re-render panel. So what we have here is the ability to define um, a new re-render. So I'm going to render out to a two-channel um, output, so 2.0 stereo, um, and it defaults to full mix. Well, if I click on the properties tab here, um, it's going to allow me to define that actually I want that to be uh, my reverbs. So here I'm going to call this verb stem 2.0 um, and now there's my uh, 2.0 output from the renderer that is following our downmix controls. So as you get started working in, uh, in producing for Dolby Atmos, um, it might be that this is something you want to explore um, and then deliver out from the Atmos mix stereo stems that then can be rebalanced, that can be recharacterized um, to make sure that you're getting the, the intent of uh, your stereo mix that you'd like. That can be further processed. Uh, you know, anything you would normally do in your stereo workflow can be applied to, uh, to those, those stereo uh, outputs. Um, so maybe you're going to master it, you know, put it through a two bus, you're going to you know, do, do, do all of the things that you would like to do. But maybe you don't want those reverbs at 5.0 to be at the same level as, as the renderer would put it in default mode. So stemming it out is going to allow you more flexibility to create um, you know, your Atmos mix and derive from their deliverables. Now, this is something that is controversial, absolutely, um, but it's, uh, it's something to explore. I, I, I don't want to suggest that we're there today where you're going to create this and be happy with it. But the controls in the renderer um, are going to allow you to more accurately or more uh, creatively define what you want that mix to be. So in the uh, trim and get down mix controls, we can do stereo low row uh, by default. We can room balance, which is going to push things more towards the rear, um, or direct render. I prefer direct render. It grabs the energy and keeps that um, uh, of, of your, your Atmos um, uh, mix and intent while preserving front rear, um, but you may not want that. So the automatic controls can be overridden by manual controls. So my height channels, I'm pulling down 12 dB um, and actually pushing them to the rear of the, uh, of the mix versus the default, which is straight down. Um, so allows you again to, to control uh, the, the mix experience um, somewhat. And this is iterating all of the time. So uh, explore these things. Um, it's there as a, as a tool. It's not there as a requirement. Um, but uh, there's, there's an awful lot of power that's baked into, uh, into, into the, the, the renderer here to allow for workflows that you have been uh, doing to exist in, um, uh, in the renderer. 
one last thing that um, we do get asked about from time to time is, you know, if you're uh, creating uh, creating these outputs, um, you know, how can you uh, ensure that you know the song name is going along with it, right? Other rather than uh, you know creating um, uh, creating you know O O one uh, as the bed uh, for all of the imports. Well, I can type the song name in here, and uh, that will import into my um, into my Pro Tools session into you know into my I/O configuration, and also save into the ADM file. So if the file name ever gets changed, uh, you can keep track of the song name in um, in in the renderer as well. So maybe for these, it doesn't become uh, just off; it becomes uh, uh, song name off, off drums song name um, and you can uh, really start to build out the metadata that's going to be running along and saving with that uh, with that ADM file for, uh, for for work downstream but also for archive materials so input configuration in in the renderer is uh, is pretty powerful and uh, uh, certainly one of the unexplored um, uh, avenues in the music industry today so Thank you for bearing with me while uh, while we went through that. Um, I'm going to uh, turn this over uh, here in short order to uh, to the wonderful Dave Cobb, um, and we'll have a, a, have a conversation about what he thinks about music. Um, this was recorded a few weeks ago on a trip to Nashville, uh, where my colleague Ben and I were actually able to take a, uh, a, a prototype um, uh, that Dolby had put together of what Atmos can sound like in a vehicle. Um, so we have a, a Tesla Model X that Dolby have outfitted with uh, a configuration that might go into a, an automobile. If you go back and look at uh, our webinar from week one um, of this series, you'll hear about uh, Dolby Atmos going into the car uh, this year. Lucid Motors uh, are putting this, uh, putting Dolby Atmos into their uh, Lucid Air uh, vehicles. Um, and uh, that's uh, that's coming online here in uh, in the latter part of the year. So very exciting to to have this, um, and uh, it's it's been a really useful tool to be able to take around to uh, um, to, to to studios and to labels uh, to demonstrate the power of Dolby Atmos, not just in getting into the home environment for movie theaters and things like that or even onto the, the mobile devices, but also go with you where you're going to listen to music. The automobile is a great, uh, great vehicle for, for, for that, um, and certainly something that we've had a lot of fun with. So take a listen to, uh, to this interview with uh, the wonderful Dave Cobb, um, and uh, I'll uh, answer your questions afterwards. So thanks for allowing us to come in here. Uh, anytime, anytime somebody calls and say they got a Dolby Atmos Tesla and I want to hang out, <laughs> I'm going to answer the call. You know? Well, you know, here in Nashville, you're a pretty early adopter of Dolby Atmos uh, as a production uh, uh, tool. Uh, certainly, you can right. install Dolby Atmos in your home studio. Right. We're here in this beautiful RCA Studio A, um, and you know, obviously, all the history that comes along with this. You know, what inspires you making music? Uh, you know, obviously you've chosen this town to be, make, make home. What, 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 what does that mean to you? As far as making music, I, I think music is a curse. You know, I think, I think you may want curse me to make music. It's ah, probably the better go. question. No, no, I, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's, uh, I feel like we get to be forever young in this business and, 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 and we use our imagination much the same, probably a kindergartner used their imagination. So anything to keep everything light and, and be able to kind of, Come up with a crazy idea and, and 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 come in a place where you can actually pull it off and is, is a fun thing to do. And Atmos is an extension of that because you know you've always had these fantasies about being in a space or having things fly around your head. Now we're playing Star Wars in the studio, which is a fun thing. You know? Fantastic. I mean, you're clearly you know surrounded by instruments here, right? It's, it's the inspiration and you know the the ability to do anything at any moment. Right. You know, you refer to it as, you know, <coughs> toddlers creating, right? Yeah. You know, we, we hear it talked about, you know, the bigger box of crayons and all of those sort of things. I mean, is that... Never like crayons. Never <laughs> a fan. It's more like Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Yeah. Clan... You got your crayon people, you got your Play-Doh people. Uh -huh. no. no, it's... it's. 
it's really actually a fun thing because you know I think since since I've been alive and and even listening to records they've been stereo so I don't think anything's really cracked the stereo boundaries and so I can only imagine what it must have been like you know when the advent of stereo came and all of a sudden you were getting to have more playing field it, as a matter of fact it's funny because I think in a stereo field you're always limited to what the priority is is it the vocal is it the guitar solo is it the drum sound whatever it is you always kind of have to put things in a box and make priorities and make a checklist whereas atmos i feel like i can hear everything that's around me and i can i can prioritize lots more things you know if i can have the the vocal have a center speaker and and that's the commanding thing from that and then i can have the guitar the part that's so important and crucial to the guitar player have its own space you can hear everything in that so i feel like we have more ability to see deeper into a picture that we right. never had prior to more, more recent times so. nice and you know tone, tonal expansion and, uh, yeah it's fun <laughs> it's fun and it's funny because i've called a couple of people when when uh, the atmos thing kind of came to, to light and i said you know how do you what do you do and like we don't know it's the wild west and, <laughs> and i like that i like that being the wild west I, i'm certain there was a time you know, I, I remember when the internet became a thing and it was the wild west and you can do anything and there are yeah. no rules. And I feel like we're in that space now yeah. with uh, with audio that we're in the wild west. I think it's a great, exciting time to kind of be the first people to really dive in and, and, and try to figure it out. And there's so much to learn. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's it's exciting because I'm learning something every time I, I get a chance to, to, to use it. Cool. Yeah, I mean it's it's it, it's funny. When I was I was listening to your Southern Accent radio show, which is can you do a Southern great. accent? I, I come on, I, I'm not going to try. Come on, no, no, I'm not. I gonna... watch TV. There's not there's not even <laughs> a Southern person in a Southern phrase program. It's, you guys are always from the UK that do these uh, accents. So I know. Give us one. How you doing, y'all? Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, honey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the one I've learned. Bless your heart. Bless, yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. You got the right term. That's there what we say. Yeah. You know what that means, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. You're, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice way to be yeah, nice. that's very true. Um, no, I mean, so, um, you know, we uh, list, listening to your show, you talked uh, a lot about the Beatles and the inspiration yeah. that, that was uh, to you. And I think, you know, now, you know, you refer to it as the Wild West. I think when, when Giles was working on, you know, Sgt. Pepper and the exploration of those, you know, kind of early albums, it was that, where he was, you know, exploring that box of crayons that, you know, he and his dad George, and Jeff yeah, would have yeah. loved to have had. Um, you know, I mean, it's it just a great story to uh, to kind of extrapolate. I mean, those that. those records are huge to me because, I mean, really, it's the advent. They may not have been the inventor of every one of these technologies, but they certainly were the first people to make a mainstream from flanging to phasing to yeah. doubling to, you know, wow. reverse. Swinging the mics. Yeah, and, and the, the ta tape loops, everything. So, you know, maybe we're in a time where we're going to, discover our new flanging or our new looping and i mean there's technologies within dolby that we haven't found yet and i'm excited about that absolutely and that's that's kind of what i'm i'm, I'm excited about as well yeah. you know getting the record makers working in in dolby atmos so you know, i think it's gonna be a fun a fun time i mean now i'm starting to see labels uh, every time ask for an atmos mix as well i think it'd be a fun thing for a listener to have your album mix and then your atmos mix that's completely different Right. You know, so it's a different experience. You can yeah. experience the the artist's vision in a different way. Mm -hmm. So so you'll have two good yeah. representations of, of, of the album. Absolutely. Well, you know, I'm I'm excited for for, for where we're going. Um, you know, I think the uh, the, the, the the expansion of, of Dolby Atmos is, is is very definitely you know happening, and that's 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 cool. Um, when you when when we first talked about it. You were thinking you know, very much in a kind of cinematic uh, way. You're you know, telling stories about music in uh, in, a, in an AV format. Right. How do you how do you, you change that conception? Have you changed that conception? No, I think I think in record making in general. I mean, I'm a huge Marconi fan, and I love I love looking at music as score. Mm -hmm. I've always looked at record making the same way somebody looks at the film score. So this is actually gives me the ability to make a film score of a record, nice. you know, which is which is a fun thing, you know. So uh, I don't know. It's uh, lands obviously everything in a landscape. So this is this is a much bigger uh, landscape. Fantastic. So uh, you hear uh, music in the Tesla? Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I got a Tesla. Where's my where's my where's my Dolby Atmos? You, you know? got to call Elon. Uh, you know? uh, it's uh, no, it's I mean it. You talk about the cinematic view, right? You've got the yeah. big glass view around you. You know what? I, I'm going to be, I'm going to say the wrong thing here. Uh -huh. 
because I could not listen to music in that Tesla and drive. Of course, you don't have to drive in Tesla, right. but I think I would wreck. <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, especially, can you imagine listening to an actual movie in a Tesla oh. in Atmos while you're driving? You hear a bang and a crash in the back. Uh, yep. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably, yeah, I'd probably have to, you know, wear a neck brace to uh -huh. listen to it in the car. Yeah, there's a um, there's a podcast that is uh, is being done in Dolby Atmos, um, uh, the left left center game and or left right game, sorry. Uh, by is that Q, what it's called by, by Q Code. Yes. Ah, yeah, um, yeah. And, like it's, and the you know, first episode starts with a car crash, and the car oh. crash is right over behind your left shoulder. So listening to it in the uh, in the Tesla was pretty freaky. It's uh, <laughs> but oh, uh, you know excited for where that's going to come. Oh yeah. Um, so your radio show, you know, you're thinking, I, be I, I've, I've been trying to get everybody to do it. I think that'd be all right. It'd be awesome. It'd yeah, be so yeah. much fun. You know, I want to do a psychedelic episode, you know, to, to launch it. So we'll see, we'll see if, uh, if it all comes together, but I plan on it and I hope to be the first at it. Like, uh, like old boy was to space the other day. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wonderful. I don't want to be second. So <laughs> don't tell anybody these ideas. <laughs> well, you're telling the world right ah, now. So <laughs> damn it. the world, it's, it's, it's all good. Well, I thought of it. First. <laughs> there we go. Dave Cobb, yeah, Patton. Yeah. Um, cool. So, um, you know, you, you work with a variety of different artists. Um, you know, how do you how do you explore the sonic field with with an artist to start with? It depends on the artist. I mean, I always look at my, my favorite artists are, are singers. I mean, it's just have, working with somebody who's a great voice. I'm always looking for a voice because I think that's the, the universal thing that everyone you know, hears first. So. It really depends on the artist. I mean, I try to get to whatever the heart or the emotion is. So it could be just a voice, you know. Right. And even in an immersive world, you can have the voice, but then you could mm -hmm. put the space around it or the environment around it. I've always, uh, a lot of times I play on records. I'm here in the studio and I'm playing guitar right next to the singer. Right. And, I, and I think, or sometimes the band is surrounding where I'm at. And I think it'd be a fun thing to kind of put them in that perspective. Yeah. Of either the artist where they're singing and, and the and the way things are framed around them, yeah. or the musicians themselves. So there's a lot of fun to be had in that world, you know. Yeah. So you did some work on uh, A Star Is Born, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah I did. Um, so I mean, the, there's a there's a testimonial Bradley gave uh, about Dolby Atmos being part, of, I, not just saying a character in the story, but you oh know, wow, you know, the, those sort of things. And there's a beautiful rendition um, of just him and the guitar that you know exactly is right. That. It's very intimate. And you're you're hearing the space around it, um, so yeah, totally totally appreciate that with you. Um, you did a lot of work with John Prine. I did a, I did an album with him, and I did his last song. Uh, unfortunately, he never did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's um, you know beautiful storytelling in in, in that. He's a master. I don't know anybody that that can write something that that makes you smile and it also makes you cry at the same time. Mm -hmm. That it was his gift. Yeah. Well, you know, you get, get getting the ability to work with you know all of these great uh, great artists, and do you find yourself becoming part of their art or uh, a supplement to it? I don't know, man. I'm just I'm good. I'm a good hang. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know where to order KFC and when. You know, I, I know how to order junk food and and how to drink good wine. So, nice. uh, no, it's fun. It, it's it's amazing. I mean, there's been so many opportunities where I've worked with people that I'm absolutely terrified to be in a room with because mm -hmm. I'm such a big fan. You know, uh, and and so it's amazing to uh, to get to know these people, and, and I think with making music, you really get to know them because the, all the walls are down. You know, yeah. uh, I got a chance to make a record, uh, produce a record with for Barry Gibb last year, and I'm a, such a big Bee Gees fan. Early Bee Gees is some of my favorite records, and just to be in a room with him and hear his stories and hear about the you know, the evolution of the records that I love and these guys define the things that I steal from now. So it was, it was just a, it was emotional and really cool. And to realize like what a great human being he is and, and how deep his thoughts are when he picks up a pen and writes, it was, it was pretty powerful. And there's a great cast of characters on that. So it was that fun. Record. It was fun. We're going to do it again. I'm yeah. Excited about it. yeah. Yeah. Nice. So you had Dolly Parton, Olivia Newton John, yeah, Keith, Keith Urban. Yeah. It was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. It was pretty much my childhood. You know, nice. In the best way. There you go. It's not Christmas in July, but that was Christmas oh, at yeah. Christmas. That was, That's uh, true. That was a great record. That's very true. Cool. Um, so, uh, what's next? What What are you uh, What are you excited about? I'm excited about film. I've, I've been messing, with dabbling in film the last two or three years. I'm excited about the world of film and music coming together and really marrying 
you know, Nashville with Hollywood and, and trying to trying to find a way to continually make music, not only a, a, a record come out of two speakers, but make the music experience immersive, mm -hmm. be it, you know, in storytelling with film and music at the same time and being able to obviously fly something behind your head. Sounds yeah, like yeah. fun. Uh, flying behind your head's cool. It's uh, you know, it's not. <laughs> That's all I do with Atmos, by the way. If you listen to any of my mixes, <laughs> I just I just have a drone that I fly around the studio. And you, there we go. That's perfect. Um, so you're working on a on all this project. I understand. I, I am. I'm not sure how much I can talk about that right now. But okay, yeah, fair yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. you know, my wife is personally very excited. For I'm us, very uh, excited so, about uh, it. It's, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of, of Elvis. Yeah. I'm super excited about this. S sitting in a room with a lot of history there, and uh, yeah, you know, so very, uh, very, very cool to be able to do that. Um, uh, you, you mentioned earlier you're going out on the road this this summer. Yeah. How much does that you know performance aspect you know play into your your production? Not necessarily an atmosphere. I, I, just... Yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. I think it's I think it's kind of actually a nice break. You know, yeah. here in the studio every day I come in and. And it's my job to kind of, you know, uh, make a lot of calls, you know, with arrangement or songs or even what you order for dinner or lunch. And <laughs> and out there, I'm I just I do what I'm told to do, and I love it. It's like a oh, just show up over there at that time. You're gonna pick me up. Okay, just <laughs> play that song. Okay. So I actually I like it. It's it's like a cut, cutting off, great, and just enjoying the moment and yeah. being on stage with friends and playing incredible music. So I'm excited about that. And you find your tone and you play that. Well, it's just fun. It's fun, you know, as, as a kid dreaming of playing these these kind of venues and this size venue and it's, it's living out your childhood fantasy. So I get to do that and then I get to go back to work. Nice. I get back in the studio. Yeah. So you've uh, you've lived and worked all over the States. Uh, you grew yeah. up in Georgia, yeah. if I'm not Correct, mistaken, yeah. and you know, got your break in the music industry in Los Angeles. Correct. Uh, what made you, na you know, gravitate to Nashville? Nashville, I'm saying this with the utmost respect. Uh, Na Nashville is the is the Alamo of the music business. It's the only place where art meets commerce, where you have record labels to sign the incredible talent that's developed and made here, because you can afford to get together and, and and rehearse in your house in your garage, and and there's publishers here for songwriters, and and it's just it's just the huge infrastructure, and a, and an affordable enough place where you can actually afford to take chances and create art and grow as an artist. So I'm here because the art is here. Nice. You know? And put to get people together in a room and actually play together. Yeah, and I think I think it, it, I'm I'm certain it's the capital of the world for musicians playing together mm. in a room and playing live. Yeah, you know, so it's and the talent of musicians here is just insanity. I mean, you don't you don't need doctoring when you have these this level of player. You know? mm. so. Yeah, it's all about the you know, capture and the, yeah you know, pre presentation of that art and, and preservation of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well. Well, so Dave, thank you so much for, for Thanks, spending man. a few minutes with you uh, here today. I uh, look forward to you, you know, creating more in, in Atmos and uh, and hearing that work in, uh, in in the world. Thank you, guys. Such a pleasure, thank you man. So much. Thanks. All right. Cheers. All right. Thank you, Dave Cobb. Um, it was. Uh, Always the most fun part of my job is talking to uh, to creatives and, uh, and engineers, and uh, I uh, really enjoyed that uh, the time of day. And uh, uh, yeah, look forward to look forward to doing it again. Um, all right, so back to our uh, regularly scheduled programming here. Um, so let me move our tools out of the way because need to share the screen. So here you find um, you know a bunch of our uh, workflow guidelines and things like that. Um, so you know as as this becomes more and more part of the um, the, the, the ecosystem, uh, Dolby Atmos being adopted by the labels and uh, uh, distribution services to get out into the world, assembling albums and uh, you know, making sure that you're you're delivering to spec has become very important. So these resources. Uh, are there to help you uh, guide guide you through getting your your music out there, um, and uh, if you follow the uh, the guidelines, um, then uh, you should be set up for success. Um, uh, if you're interested in getting your studio up and running, um, we're here to help you um, to ensure that you've got the right answers to the questions that you have, that they fit into your workflow. Um, and um, so we can connect you with our wonderful reseller uh, team around the world 
uh, who will be able to actually help you get up and running with, with Dolby Atmos in your, your studio. Um, and there's a, a, there's a good body of learning resources. Um, I point to them uh, a bunch, but learning.dolby.com uh, will help you to uh, understand this, uh, this workflow. It can be complicated at times, um, but uh, the resources there will certainly help to uh, allow you to understand the whole ecosystem of Dolby Atmos um, and then pick and choose what you actually want from it. So those re-render uh, functionalities, they're covered in the learning resources. They talk about post-production, but they're, as you see, they're equally applicable to, to music workflows. Um, so check out those resources um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, and then beyond that, on our website, professional.w.com, uh, you'll find a, a good bunch of, uh, of, of resources as well. So how to get started working with Ableton, with Logic, uh, with um, you know, other, other workstations as well, Nuendo um, and uh, various things. Um, a lot of great resources that uh, that you can uh, you can you can lean on. Um, again, more more resources for labels, creatives. Uh, we're here to answer your questions. So all of this can be found on professional.dolby.com, um, and uh, very excited to to help you get uh, creating in Dolby Atmos and delivering out to uh, to all of the services. Okay, um, so uh, the question and answer session. Um, for those of you that are interested in um, utilizing our uh, free production uh, suite demo, then uh, I'm going to leave that up there for you now. But we've um, got, some, got some questions to answer already, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll definitely uh, uh, be happy to accept more. So, uh, all right, the first one. Um, can the ADM file be exported at 96K? Um, so today, the, the, the delivery mechanism for the Dolby Atmos ADM is 48K. Um, uh, it's, it, it might well expand in the future, but if you're working at 96K, uh, creating the DAMP file, the Dolby Audio Master file, uh, Dolby Atmos Master file, sorry, is, um, is possible at 96K with the Dolby Atmos renderer. Um, once you've got that uh, file at 96K, then you can export uh, from that um, uh, the ADM at 48K, and it will do the sample rate conversion for you. Um, but you've already got that mezzanine Dolby Atmos master file at 96K ready for if it expands in the future. Um, also, you can work at 96K and derive those stereo stems at 96K from that Atmos master. So it's definitely possible to, to work at 96K in, in Dolby Atmos, um, just uh, not export the uh, the MP4, uh, the um, the ADM at, uh, at that sample rate today. Can the 514 format be used in the monitoring pull down? Yes, absolutely. And here's how. Um, so, oops, that was not what I wanted to do. There we go, put that back up. That's my slide. Okay, so um, very similar. If, if you go into the window menu, um, there's a lot of options. So assuming that you're not in headphone only mode, so headphone only mode is under preferences. Um, and if you turn that on, it disables a bunch of the functionality I'm going to show you. So you definitely want to be out of headphone only mode. Um, and then if you come into your window menu and your room setup, um, this is going to define which speakers you have. So you can turn them on or off. So you've got your wide speakers making it to 914. Uh, 916 with the, with the overheads, um, and if you've got a larger room, then we can talk about array mode. Not going to do that right now. Um, but what that enables us to do is um, then also uh, set up different monitoring configurations. So you can add a monitor layout um, and say that this is going to be my LCR only, um, and we're going to turn off the, the speakers that are not part of the LCR. Um, so you'll see here that I've got my 514, uh, 2.0, 5.1, 7.1, um, and uh, even a 614 uh, configuration. So if I hit accept on that, that is gonna populate in my, my layouts here. So if I go to my physical layout, uh, my physical layout is 7.1.4, um, and then I can 
uh, also define 7.1, 2.0, as you'll have seen already, but 5.14 is uh, able to, to play out of the renderer. This is purely monitoring. Uh, for those of you wondering what the 6.14 was, it's without the center speaker, but everything else. Um, and uh, um, at that point, it's going to create the, uh, the image across the, uh, the front. Um, so, and there's our LCR. So yes, the, the renderer is flexible to allow you to, uh, to have that, uh, that, that, that choice of controls um, and uh, um, many, many more. Let me hide again the uh, Dolby Atmos renderer. Oops, not the renderer. Uh, there we go. That. There we go. Um, can you work with Atmos using a binaural system, or do you need 5171 equipment? Um, you absolutely can get started working with with Dolby Atmos in binaural. Um, what I'd say is that you know that is going to be. Um, uh, you know, particularly challenging for going out into speaker-based playbacks. Right? So we talked about the car as being a, a mechanism. Um, obviously, with um, with playing in um, uh, in Apple Music today, that's a uh, that's a five point uh, that's a, a speaker-based uh, uh, decode um, that's being virtualized. Um, and um, uh, there's 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 a lot of functionality there that enables you to work in uh, in binaural monitor in binaural in in the renderer, but we really encourage you to work at least at some point over speakers, um, and whether that's a five one four or you know something uh, you know, at, at least getting the impression of what's going on in in the room and how that's characterized is going to be incredibly valuable for your mixed translation. Uh, obviously, Dolby Atmos is going to car, as you heard earlier. So, you know that's going to be a speaker-based playback in in the car. So, yes, you can get started and work in, in binaural, but I'd really encourage you to uh, to to figure out getting speakers and uh, uh, or find somewhere to 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 work in speaker-based playbacks. Can you get into the main difference between the mastering suite versus the production suite? Well. Um, you know, this is a, a really interesting one. So I, I had a revelation a couple of weeks back um, and uh, I'm gonna share it with you. So uh, more and more, we we see, you know, the mastering suite, you know, be part of the, 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 the post-production workflows, right? So the post-production workflows, you've got multiple uh, systems on a, on a mix stage, feeding into probably a recorder and then into the, into the renderer. That requires working in a sidecar system. So that's our sidecar workflows. So that's gonna accept metadata coming from multiple different sources and uh, some audio coming from different sources and consolidating into the, into the renderer. Um, with the production suite, um, that's not possible. So the sidecar workflows don't, are not supported. Um, so it's all in one single system in the box. When it comes to music workflows, what we tend to see is that you know if somebody is producing in Dolby Atmos, we end up with seeing you know them use the mastering suite more. That might be because they've got external instruments that they want to feed into their workstation, and they've got you know they they want to do vocal overdubs, they want to do you know tracking stuff alongside of what they're then capturing. So we find that the mastering suite actually sits into those production workflows uh, a lot easier. Um, and then the production suite, weirdly, ends up working more in the in, in the mastering side. That is not a global statement. That is just um, you know if somebody is working more in the box, um, which uh, more and more we see uh, see folks doing, um, then they're happy to work with the production suite with Dolby Audio Bridge and uh, feeding out into their their speaker systems. So the mastering engineers and the, the final mix engineers or mix down engineers actually are, are using more and more production suite versus the mastering suite, which we see uh, end up in producers' uh, spaces. So that's the main difference: sidecar workflows and uh, uh, and um, uh, you know, essentially it, the mastering suite might fit into your workflow smoother and easier than the production suite. Uh, particularly if you want to do overdubs, tracking, etc. 
how does mastering music work in Atmos? Do you master in the renderer? Um, no. So you're going to use your existing workstation. Um, so you know, whether you're a, uh, a Nuendo user or a Pro Tools user or you know, the, the ADM is often going to be the, the source that you receive from your mix engineer. Uh, which is why them setting the input configurations and things like that is going to help a mastering engineer in their job. Um, the mastering engineer is then going to uh, you know, uh, work, work, work alongside of the renderer. Um, but the renderer, excuse me, the renderer itself is uh, predominantly uh, a monitoring um, uh, function at that point, unless you're then needing to record that 96K master file. Um, so um, the, the mastering process uh, is, is largely back to the translation of how this is going to uh, come from a, a mix room and your trusted mastering suite, your, your mastering mix room, um, uh, and then into the, uh, into the consumer world. Um, so ensuring that the translation is, is appropriate for, uh, for, for, for the for the binaural on Tidal, and then the the, the Apple Music playout, and uh, you know all of the various uh, configurations that might exist in the consumer world, the mastering engineer is going to be ensuring that uh, that that's going to translate to the best uh, possible capability. Um, aside from that, it's you know working within album structures versus the um, the previous uh, iterations where track-based mixing has been uh, the focus. So delivering to, uh, to Amazon in the, in, in the initial phase was, uh, was, was very much a track-based endeavor. Um, but we've seen more and more um, collaborative uh, mixers working and then needing to deliver a single project. Um, that's where the mastering engineer is going to be completely critical to the, to the path the album delivery, making sure that everything is, is taken care of. So, um, uh, you know, the, 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 mastering, the mastering community is coming around and figuring out what Dolby Atmos means to them. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a continually evolving um, uh, storyline there. Um, is it possible to check your mix in Apple spatial format before you deliver the Atmos master? Yes, absolutely. Um, so, if you uh, if you recall from a couple of weeks back or a couple of months back now, um, the renderer actually allows you to export um, a uh, an MP4. That MP4 is the uh, DV plus jock that's going to play out for um, for for you know, um, speaker based playback, and that's what um, is is the virtualization that's occurring on uh, on Apple Spatial. So they are um, virtualizing that. So the closest thing I can get uh, uh, to that is from the, your master file, export an MP4 and put it onto an iOS device running 14.6 or above. Um, listen with some AirPod Pros or AirPod Maxes um, and that is the, the, the spatial um, uh, experience that you'll have on Apple Music um, via headphones. For Apple Music via an Apple TV into a soundbar, and you'll also be taken care of because it's Dolby Atmos powering that experience. So if you're at home with your Apple TV and your Sonos Arc, uh, or your Sennheiser Ambio, or your, uh, your um, Vizio soundbar, it's going to be the speaker-based uh, DV Plus jock that is going to be delivering that experience for you. Um, what is your recommendation for referencing already released Atmos music, best speaker practice and headphone option? Um, so uh, covered this a little while back in the, in the studio uh, session and also in Stan Kybert's uh, session. Um, playing back into a studio environment is, is, is more challenging and, and um, uh, more, more costly than um, perhaps any of us would like. Um, so relying on you know either a uh, an A to D conversion from a uh, receiver, so you know, playback from a Blu-ray player with a USB stick or from a streaming service into um, uh, input of a receiver, HDMI based, and then out into, uh, into the, 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 the pre-out of a receiver. Um, uh, or 
um, then headphone based is is an entirely different piece. Um, something we've 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 covered a lot uh, previously. Um, but uh, there are mechanisms in the consumer world to absolutely get that character uh, that that playback uh, operating. In the professional world, it becomes a little more challenging. So depending on where you're aiming, um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be a slightly different answer. But there are mechanisms out there. We just need to figure out what's right for your environment and your studio, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll definitely be able to advise on that. How do you get your studio Dolby Atmos certified? Is that something you need to offer the services? Um, so we killed Dolby Atmos certification. Um, so Dolby Atmos certification was something that existed for home entertainment um, and has never existed for music. We do not do Dolby Atmos certification for music studios. That said, the music studio onboarding process will offer you the best advice uh, for your uh, environment. So working from the best practices uh, guidelines, which you can find on professional.dolby.com uh, slash music, um, and then um, making sure that that fits the, into a correct answer for your studio. Um, that's, that's the way to um, make sure that we're, we're giving you the right advice. Very simple process to get involved with. Um, so if you, uh, if you jump to that QR code, uh, or go to our website, professional.dolby.com forward slash music, you'll also find a link to the form. But that's going to um, give you access to then, once you've completed all of your, um, all of your, your, um, your, your room setup <clears throat> and it matches our requirements, um, then potentially you can be listed on dolby.com as well so that uh, that can be uh, advertising for your, for your services. You do not need to be Dolby Atmos certified to deliver Dolby Atmos music, um, and uh, but we do encourage you to reach out and make sure that you're creating in the most effective way for your studio and your workflow. So uh, yeah, happy to help uh, to uh, ensure that that is uh, is true of your your situation. Um, <clears throat> okay, so a um, couple of questions that came through pre-submitted. Uh, is this process making hardware gear like consoles, uh, uh, you know, SSL fusion obsolete? No, absolutely not. Um, so again, part of that post-production, uh, part of that um, uh, music studio onboarding process is designed to help answer your questions uh, about, you know, how how can I integrate my console? Can I do, you know, this with an SSL? Can I do this with a Neve? United just did it uh, in Studio D for uh, Dion Wilson's room with a Neve 88R. Um, and so we're here to advise and to help you work with resellers to understand how your workflow can fit into Dolby Atmos. But we're certainly not killing any of the uh, any of the consoles. Um, and uh, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, good stuff happening in in that world that uh, um, I think you you'll be very interested to uh, to, to watch happen. Um, Okay, checking on back on my questions from this session. Um, do, um, oh yeah. Anyway, um, just looking here at the, <laughs> the previous questions. Um, is there an ETA for Apple Silicon Mac versions of the Music Panner AU? Um, uh, coming soon. Um, I I don't have an ETA. Um, I have a working alpha of the uh, of, of the renderer on a, a silicon, um, but uh, you wouldn't want to use it in production today. So uh, don't ask. It's going to hurt you more than it's going to help you. Um, so uh, definitely worth uh, you know, sticking with uh, Core i7 for the uh, for the time being on the Mac side, um, and we'll uh, we'll let you know as soon as that changes, um, and uh, we hope that it will be very very soon. So um, yeah, watch this space, and you bet I will tell you about it in a webinar coming up here pretty uh, pretty soon. So uh, thanks for joining. Uh, look forward to uh, uh, to speaking to you all again next next month. Um, reach out with any questions, musicstudios at dolby.com um, or via our website, professionalsupport.dolby.com, uh, where we have a growing knowledge base and uh, um, a, a, a 
a growingly active forum as well. Um, and that's man 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. So uh, feel free to uh, ask your questions there and uh, help the community to grow. Um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, as I say, I look forward to seeing you all again next month. Have a great day.